This is Unsung History, the podcast where we discuss people and events in American history that haven't always received a lot of attention. I'm your host, Kelly Therese Pollack. I'll start each episode with a brief introduction to the topic and then talk to someone who knows a lot more than I do. Be sure to subscribe to Unsung History on your favorite podcasting app so you never miss an episode. And please, Tell your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, maybe even strangers to listen to. On a hot Saturday afternoon in August 1806, five students at Williams College in Massachusetts were praying in a grove, as they did twice a week. On this particular day, A fierce thunderstorm drove them out of the grove to take shelter under a haystack. As they later told the story, it was under that haystack that 23-year-old Samuel J. Mills Jr. proposed that they share the gospel in Asia and throughout the world. That haystack prayer meeting was the inspiration for the founding of the Congregationalist American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions, ABCFM, in 1810. Two years later, the first ABCFM mission headed to India. Of the eight missionaries who set off to what was then part of the British Empire, three were women. In 1812, of course, the United States was at war with Britain and those American missionaries were promptly arrested, as they had no right to proselytize in India. Undaunted, the ABCFM continued to send missionaries around the world. Over the next three decades, sponsoring missions to China, Singapore, Greece, Turkey, the Sandwich Islands, or what we now call Hawaii, Western and Southern Africa, and many other locales. It wasn't just the ABC FM. Soon, other Protestant denominations had their own missionary societies. In the early 19th century, the ABC FM considered missions to indigenous nations in North America to be within its scope of foreign missions. It was in this context that the corresponding secretary, of the organization, Jeremiah Everts, in 1825, published a series of anonymous essays to argue against the removal of the Native Americans from their native lands. The ABCFM, too, was closely involved in two Supreme Court cases dealing with the removal of the Cherokee Nation from Georgia. Despite the support of the missionaries, the Cherokee Nation lost Cherokee Nation v. Georgia and was forced on the deadly march west to Oklahoma, known as the Trail of Tears. Some of the missionaries accompanied them. It wasn't just within the borders of the United States that missionaries involved themselves in political and legal affairs. And they did so sometimes in places where the United States did not yet have an official diplomatic presence. The United States Department of State was created by Congress in 1789 as the first federal agency. President George Washington appointed Thomas Jefferson as his first Secretary of State. As crucial as this executive department was to the functioning of a brand new country, though, it was quite small, consisting of the secretary, a few clerks, and a part time translator. By 1830, nearly two decades after the ABCFM had begun sending missionaries around the world, the Department of State had a mere 23 employees within the U.S and another 153 stationed across the globe, leaving many regions without any U.S. officials. 
With the small global footprint of the State Department, missionaries played an important role, providing vital intelligence as they wrote in detail and lectured about their experiences in places like China, India, and the Sandwich Islands. Because they were seen as experts on the places they had served, missionaries were sometimes tapped by the U.S. government for official work, as translators and advisors, and sometimes even diplomatic officials. Samuel Wells Williams, for instance, spent decades in China, first taking charge of the ABCFM printing press there when he was just 21 years old, in 1833. At the time, there was only one other American missionary in China, Elijah Bridgman, who was working on books of Chinese lexicography that Williams assisted with. By 1848, Williams was the editor of the Chinese Repository, an English-language periodical published in China, for which Williams contributed over a hundred articles. Williams reached an even larger audience with the publication of his book, The Middle Kingdom, a survey of the geography, government, education, social life, arts, religion, etc., of the Chinese Empire and its inhabitants, which helped introduce the eager American public to Chinese culture. Williams didn't just contribute to American knowledge of China, however. He also worked for the U.S. government. As an interpreter on Commodore Perry's 1853 expedition to Japan, as Secretary of the United States Legation to China starting in 1855, and as Chargé d'Affaires for the U.S. in Beijing from 1860 to 1876. As the official U.S. presence grew throughout the world, the relationship between the missionaries and the State Department became more complicated. Missionaries often demanded consular presence and assistance in places that may otherwise not have been a high priority for the U.S. government. Sometimes, too, the religious work of missionaries was not welcomed in the host country, where the practice of Christianity, or at least Christian proselytization, could be illegal. The U.S. government was often placed in the challenging position of trying to assist American citizens while also respecting local laws, leading the State Department to term these and related issues as missionary troubles. The United States still has a strong foreign missionary tradition. As of 2010, the director of the Center for the Study of Global Christianity at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary in Massachusetts estimated that the United States sent 127,000 of the world's missionaries abroad over a quarter of the total population of foreign missionaries, and almost four times as many as the next most popular sending country, Brazil. For its part, the United States State Department has grown tremendously since its formation, now employing around 13,000 members of the Foreign Service, 11,000 civil service employees, and 45,000 local staff at over 270 diplomatic missions. Joining me now is Dr. Emily Conroy Krutz, Associate Professor of History at Michigan State University and author of Missionary Diplomacy, Religion and 19th Century American Foreign Relations. Jesus
Emily, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yes, I'm thrilled to be speaking with you. So I, I want to hear a little bit about how this is, I believe, your second book. So how you got into writing this book and developing this topic. Absolutely. Yeah, my first book is on a somewhat related topic. It's Christian Imperialism, Converting the World in the Early American Republic, I think was our subtitle. And that looked at um, Protestant missionaries and ideas about empire in about the 18 teens, the 1840s. And so this book really did emerge out of conversations I had after Christian imperialism came out and was talking to folks, particularly in sort of the world of the history of foreign relations, who were you know, interested in the book. And I got a, a couple of questions that um, were like, okay, so if you see these missionaries who have ideas about empire, who are sort of talking amongst themselves about imperialism and are going out into these imperial spaces, you know, what does that matter for U.S. policy? Like, does that actually have any effect or is this just a story about these missionaries off in the corner? And so I sort of went from there because um, I was like, well, it, yeah, they had, they they did make a difference and they made a difference in a couple of different ways. And I think telling a long story over the course of, so this book goes from um, 18 teens to, uh, to the 1920s to sort of look at the way that sort of this Protestant mission movement grew up alongside the sort of development um, development of the State Department and sort of American diplomatic infrastructure. So one of the things that I found was that missionaries and diplomats had a slightly different geographic footprint. And so the places where missionaries were going were a little bit different than where early American diplomats really got excited about. And this really positioned missionaries to have um, have a lot of influence. And so as I got deeper into the research, I was finding that missionaries are, you know, they're all over the place, but it's slightly differently than the government. And so that creates these really interesting relationships where they actually have a, a, a pretty big impact on 19th century policy. And I think going into the 20th century, sort of the how Americans think about the world, the places they care about, that missionaries can tell people where they should care about. And they're telling the public and they're also telling government officials in really important ways. Yeah, including up to presidents. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So let's talk a little bit about how how you tackle this kind of research, right? This is, as you said, over a century worth of history. It's global, literally all over the world. So how do you figure out, how did you figure out, you know, where to go looking for what sorts of materials you were thinking about uh, as you were putting this all together? Yeah, it was, I mean, I knew I wanted to be sure to get both sort of two sides of the story, a missionary side and a government side. What you won't see much of here, um, and largely due to my own inability to do the languages, and in part because I think just the way I structured the argument, is I don't have much sort of foreign language sources from the people that missionaries are interacting with. It's, this is really a missionary to government story, to U.S. government story. So I used a lot of archives from um, both published and unpublished from missionary organizations. And so almost um, the plug for Presbyterian Historical Society in Philadelphia is one of the best places to research. Houghton Library, Union Theological Seminary, Yale Divinity School, places like that. And then I also was in the National Archives and working with the foreign relations of the U.S., series. You know, part of the research story for this book, too, is that I was you know, doing the research and the writing during COVID. And so would not have been able to do it without Hathi Trust and digitization of some presidential papers and things like that. And uh, a friend working, uh, Sarah Giorgini, working at the uh, John Quincy Adams, uh, working at Mass Historical Study, could help me sort of get through the John Quincy Adams materials I needed to see. So, yeah, I was really trying to balance those those two different things. And missionaries for better and for worse, are incredibly prolific writers. And so there was one of the, the big themes that came out in the book was uh, missionaries creating what they called missionary intelligence. Uh, so all these documents that are telling the Americans about the world. And a lot of that is has been published and is online. Um, so if you have a free afternoon and want to sort of go down some Hathi Trust uh, rabbit holes, there's some fantastic missionary texts that I had a lot of fun exploring for this book. Yeah, I don't know if everyone would want to do that, but I think listeners of this podcast might. So <laughs> the niche interest. One of the things that happens, of course, is the the changing role of the US in the world. In this time period, you're looking at 
going from a very, very small footprint globally to the U.S. by the end of World War One being everywhere across the globe and uh, the State Department being, you know, a teeny tiny little thing to being much, much bigger. So could you talk a little bit about how that affects this story that you're telling, the relationship between missionaries and the U.S. government, how it shifts as really as the U.S. government itself is changing? Yeah, over the course of the century, what we see happening is the, as you say, the government is sort of increasing its footprint and going many more places. Um, and so are the missionaries. And sometimes the government is following the missionaries, and sometimes the missionaries are following the government. And so one of the things that was really exciting to dig into more deeply here was the ways that missionaries are sort of forcing questions about what citizenship means. And so where does the State Department need to go? Uh, largely because they keep on getting into trouble. So there's this great story from the 1830s in Hawaii where um, you know, a French captain is there and is basically refuses to acknowledge that the the missionaries there are American citizens. And so he will not sort of extend them the courtesy that he's going to extend to the um, other Americans uh, in Hawaii at that time. And, you know, understandably, that leads them to freak out a little bit. And this question of, well, are we citizens or not? And what can we expect from our government? And it takes a while to get an answer because this is sort of they're on the you know, outer edges of where um, government officials really are. There's a consul there, but at, at that time, it's not a sympathetic consul. And uh, so they end up working through the Navy to get uh, information back from the State Department in Washington, who says, yes, you are citizens and you are entitled to this protection. <laughs> An important point. But one of the things that we see then is that as they're going to places where, you know, they can't reach a consul really easily or where the consuls are, if they're far away or they're unsympathetic, we see missionaries writing and demanding that the government show up for them and that they sort of increase their reach, increase their footprint. We see missionaries trying to figure out how to sort of put this delicately, right? uh, it, making generous interpretations of treaty law in places like China and going beyond where the U.S. government really wants them to go and forcing the hand of, of the government in a lot of these cases. So I talk about this dynamic in two ways in the book. I've got um, sort of back-to-back -back chapters. One is, I think I titled Victims, and it's looking at sort of when missionaries call on the government because they are being attacked for various reasons. You know, sometimes you know, we have a couple of examples of missionaries who are murdered, sometimes, you know, having nothing to do with their evangelistic work, right? They're wrong place, wrong time kind of things. And then the next chapter is Troublemakers, looking at when missionaries are indeed bending the rules and breaking the rules and demanding a government um, response. And what the missionaries will say over and over again is we are American citizens who are out in the world on legitimate business. And so we need the government needs to show up for us where where we are going. Um, I think one of the more powerful stories um, in this ends up being a, a kind of complicated one where there's missionaries who are in in the Caroline Islands um, when that was a Spanish colony. And we see this back and forth, um, ultimately, when one of the missionaries gets gets arrested and then there's a you know, sort of an anti-colonial uprising that the missionaries get get caught up in. Sort of letters between Spain and Washington and Manila and these islands as everyone is trying to figure out you know, how did the missionaries do what what the governor on this island is saying they did? Did they not? What kinds of rights do they have? And there's no consul. Um, and the consul is has been appointed, but is not yet there. And so we see sort of these increasingly frantic letters from missionaries who are, you know, make him come faster. We really need his help. And that kind of thing happens, you know, fairly regularly, which means that we have missionaries sort of calling on the government. I wouldn't go so far as to say that, you know, missionaries are the reason that the U.S. state is expanding its reach, you know, full stop over the course of the century. But it is absolutely they are pulling the government into places where, you know, the diplomatic interests were not um, particularly high until the missionaries show up. And then suddenly you have a significant American presence in these places. And now the U.S. government has to care about them. So it was somewhat surprising to me how often there were women who were acting as missionaries, sometimes even single women by themselves, in ways that you, you just wouldn't see with the U.S. government uh, at, at the time periods that you're looking at often. So could you talk a little bit about that, you know, how how that works, why these women had that, that freedom to, to go out and be missionaries and 
how that ends up playing out as people are trying to determine, you know, as the government, U.S. government is saying, like, do we need to help or not? And sometimes it matters that these are women who are in trouble. Absolutely. And I, I love that you picked up on that. I was worried that it didn't come across enough in the book. So, so that's great. <laughs> yes. After the Civil War um, and going forward, I think it might still be true today, actually, that the majority of missionaries, American missionaries overseas are women. They are absolutely numerically sort of dominating um, American missionary space. But that said, they are not the folks who the U.S. government is really talking to or sort of sees itself as as partnering with in some of these spaces, right? The women are not going to be the ones who are working as consuls. They're not going to be the ones who are working as interpreters and aides to the legations and things like that. But they are there and they are writing and they are shaping that missionary intelligence um, very heavily. And as you said, sometimes they are getting into trouble. And you know, to sort of why are they there in the first place is that from the very beginning of the mission movement, women are, American women are really excited about this possibility. I have an article in another volume that's coming out soon that looks at um, women's letters to apply to be missionaries in the very early 19th century before single women were sent out um, overseas. And it was so striking to me how many women were very excited about this movement, um, excited about it for all the reasons you, know, you might expect that it's adventure and um, gives them a lot a sort of a different kind of freedom than they have in the U.S., but also that they see it as an outgrowth of sort of their, you know, expected roles of being a, you know, work like teaching and nursing and things like that are um, very much part of missionary work. So they're able to sort of take the their expected role as sort of moral leaders into this this missionary space. And so after the Civil War, we see the creation of um, missionary boards that are specifically sending out women uh, and only women and single women who are, you know, setting up schools, they're setting up hospitals, you have women doctors going out, women nurses. And it's just, you know, there's, there's a ton of them. And I could go on at great length about sort of the kinds of work they're doing and the ways that it sort of shifts the idea from the early 19th century to the later 19th century. But I'll sort of try to keep myself focused on this question of sort of what happens with the government when they when they come into trouble. Because it is, it sometimes really makes a difference when the people who are harmed are women. So one of the, um, that example I was mentioning before in the Carolina Islands, what is really remarkable and, and is an important part of that, the diplomatic debate or discussion, I should say, across between Washington and Manila is that at the time of so one of the attacks on missionary property as the the government on the island is saying that, you know, these missionaries are sort of fomenting this anti-colonial uprising and they need to be punished. The only missionaries on the island were women. And so the American diplomats are saying that is ridiculous. How can you possibly say that these missionaries were involved because they were women? And you see all this gendered language there about, you know, how they couldn't possibly <laughs> had anything to do with these major political issues. and therefore you know, Spain needs to kind of intervene here and, and protect these poor women who need need the help and are just trying to do good in the world, right? There's another great example where it's, I think, a Teddy Roosevelt's letter where he's, there's an American woman missionary who is is kidnapped and uh, held for ransom. And he has this sort of wonderful, he's incredibly frustrated about the entire situation, but he's particularly frustrated that it's a woman because, you know, he wants to just kind of leave it that, you know, missionaries are making the choice to go out into places where they're not wanted and to do stuff that annoys the people around them, which, you know, absolutely they are doing. And that's the question that the government has to keep on facing over the course of the 19th century. You know, what do you do with these people who are tr going out and trying to um, create controversy and create dramatic cultural change? And so Roosevelt, right, wants to just say, you know, leave them to it. It's, you know, they got themselves into it, except, you know, here we have this woman who is, is, is the one in trouble. And that means that they have to intervene and they have to protect her. You know, and again, she's able to kind of hide her politics in really interesting ways. Um, and so that's something I'm hoping to dig into more in sort of my next book a little bit is think about sort of the politics of some of these women, because, you know, I think there's a lot more there than we know about what the influence um, these women had on, on some of these political conversations. 
So there's a a lot of interesting discussion in this book about who is American, who is Christian, you know, especially I think the the what really drives that home is when the US suddenly has the Philippines as a territory and there's this idea of well is this a foreign mission is this somehow a home mission because the Philippines is part of the United States now and really interestingly because most of the missionaries you're looking at are protestant is this question of should we be converting people are we converting people who are catholic they are christian already you know but they are not the kind of christian that these missionaries want them to be so could you talk a little bit about that and these these weird nuanced discussions that end up happening because of this oh absolutely the philippines case is so incredibly key for thinking about how sort of religion plays into I mean, American diplomacy more generally, colonial rule and empire. And there's, I should say, you know, my work in in that the chapter that looks at this really closely is very influenced by the work of uh, Karine Walther and Tisa Wenger, diplomatic historian and a religious studies uh, scholar who have both also talked about some of these dynamics. You know, what is what happens in in the Philippines after the wars of 1898, the U.S. right claims claims the Philippines as its colonies, and President McKinley, you know, you know, later reflects it's you know this is this apocryphal story about you know getting on his knees um, in the White House and praying to God, you know, what to do, and you know being reassured that what he needs to do is you know, to go into the Philippines, you know, to keep them, to Christianize them, to civilize them, and you know prepare them for. A future democratic self-government and missionaries love this. Um, Protestant missionaries are so incredibly um, excited. What's really interesting about this moment, right, is that if sort of the missionaries have been kind of pulling the government with them in a lot of places, this is a place where missionaries are following uh, in the footsteps of the U.S. government. Right, the government gets there first, and they are so excited to have the opportunity pretty quickly. Um, all kinds of Protestant uh, missionary organizations send out their missionaries to go there. They actually have, um, so they meet to, to sort of divvy up the islands and who's going to go where. And they are very much sort of in that mindset that this is, right, Catholicism is not, is not the kind of Christianity that they want. And American Catholics are really concerned about this correctly. And this is sort of on the heels of many years of missionaries talking and you know, really trying to make religious freedom into a centerpiece of American diplomacy and American foreign policy. And they understand and they have long understood religious freedom in an international context to mean the freedom for them to proselytize and the freedom for missionaries, um, for Protestant missionaries to be able to be, you know, wherever they want and seeking out converts. And so that's going to come, you know, create some real controversy in the Philippines case. And missionaries are there's this sort of interesting and complicated dynamic where they're both welcomed and kind of try to have a rein on them for how how active they get. Because, you know, we have, you know, Taft, who, you know, will later be president, but at this point is governor of the Philippines. You know, he's there, you know, really trying to navigate this very complicated political and religious and sort of colonial context. He, you know, goes to the Vatican. One of the things that the American, you know, what the, what the gov- U.S. government wants to do is just identify that the what they understand to be a real problem of Catholicism in the Philippines is not Catholicism as such, but the Spanish Catholic Catholicism. And so what we see sort of American Catholics and the government really trying to do is replace Spanish friars with an American, American priests, things like this, and change and trying to kind of separate with what they identify as sort of the problem there was that it was too close relationship between church and state in the Spanish era. And they're going to separate those things. And so religion, church and state are going to be separate. And that's going to be how we have religious freedom in the Philippines, uh, in this period of American rule. And Protestant missionaries are, you know, they're incredibly excited. So it's a very, it's a complicated dynamic for sure. And one of my favorite moments in it, I think you, you mentioned, is sort of this question of, you know, is this a home mission or or a foreign mission? Throughout the 19th century, missionary organizations are divided between foreign missions and and home missions. Home missions usually working with immigrant populations, uh, sometimes with frontier populations, sometimes with Native Americans. Um, Native Americans themselves get sort of switched in their categorization over the course of the century. But there's this meeting of, I think it's the Methodists, who are trying to decide 
whether their foreign mission board can send someone to the Philippines or is this properly as a as a colonial space? Is it is it foreign or is it home? And there's this great line in the annual report where they decide it is foreign. Uh, and whatever the U.S. government wants to say about this space, it is not home. It is foreign. And what's so important about that, right, is it draws our attention to the fact that this is about race. You know, this the, all of these ideas about religion and about sort of political communities and sort of thing, what they are sort of the centrality of racial categories to all of that. And so so Catherine Jen Lum's recent book, Heathen, is is really great on this point as well, thinking about the ways that religious and racial categories work together. And we see that so, so strongly uh, in this missionary case in the Philippines, as you have sort of missionaries coming out and both incredibly excited they can take advantage of the presence of the American empire there, and yet very clear, right, that this colonial space is not, it is not home, it is not the same, and it needs their their help to make it better in their eyes. You mentioned earlier that when the missionaries are asking the U.S. government for help for intervention in various places, uh, you know, they make the argument that they are U.S. citizens, they're on, uh, you know, business, essentially. And I, I think that's one of the pieces that becomes so interesting, too, is that they're not just out there proselytizing. They're not just out there, like, giving Bibles to people. They are out in the world giving humanitarian aid, building hospitals, building schools, working as translators, doing all sorts of other things in the name of religion, you know, for the goal of spreading religion and yet accomplishing these other things. So can you talk about how that complicates things for the U.S. government and the ways that that they, of course, want to help U.S. citizens? Who are these U.S. citizens? What are they doing? But they're doing good things. You know, what? how have that all of that plays together? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think the broad umbrella of missionary work works out great for the U.S. government here because these missionaries are, in a lot of the work they're doing, particularly in institution building, they are making the U.S. look good and look like a really you know good force in the world. So they are indeed, they're setting up schools. The It's one of the first things that missionaries do. They set up schools at both kind of the, you know, we think, think about today is with the elementary school level, but all the way up through colleges and universities, some of which still exist in different forms. Um, they set up medical schools. They set up hospitals um, all over the place. They have doctors who travel. They have, um, and they, they're making a real difference. Now, as they do so, I should say, right, the doctors are, in particular, can be very dismissive of um, any local medical practices that exist, right? But they, you know, hospitals are good. Doctors are good. <laughs> This is all good things to have in places. And so for, you know, the government is really happy to talk about the secular work that the missions do. And I should say publishing, uh, book publishing is a huge part of this, too, where um, mission presses around the world will be publishing, you know, translated scriptures and things like this, but also all kinds of other books and school books and things like that. And so in um, in the Ottoman Empire, in particular, this gets really complicated, and missionaries are going to get are going to be calling on the government to help them sort of navigate this because they are, as they describe themselves, the largest booksellers in the region, <laughs> and they're finding all these books seized that they are, and they're contesting that these are not, you know, some of these are religious titles, but some of them are being mischaracterized as religious titles by by the Ottomans, and the American missionaries are saying these are these are school books. I, you know, I would be more sympathetic to the Ottoman point of view here that there's the religion is kind of coming through in a lot of those, those more, you know, so-called neutral or secular texts. Um, so it's really complicated. And it's asking the government, the U.S. government to get involved in sort of parsing that question of what is and what isn't religious. And, you know, if we're talking about like a missionary hospital, is that a secular space or is that a religious space? And what's really helpful for you know, sort of paying attention to the 19th century context here is that, you know, missionaries, as they set up schools, as they set up hospitals, they think about them as both providing humanitarian and sort of civilizing care, but also as creating places where they will get a captive audience. And so, you know, missionary doctors will write prescriptions on paper that is, you know, on the back has scripture, written. Uh, They will hire um, what are called Bible women to be in the waiting rooms. Um, And these were 
you know, local women who uh, were Christians who could basically sort of pray aloud and um, sort of lead in, in religious teachings in the waiting room um, and also come visit you while you were healing in your bed um, and sometimes come follow up to visit you in your home. And so there is a, there's a, I think what a lot of, you know, modern readers sort of see as a, a blurriness and a confusion of these categories that for 19th century Americans, I think mostly was more legible that the sort of porousness of these categories between what was secular and what was religious, you know, there was there was no hard and fast rule. And so that does indeed get really complicated for the government when it um, is trying to figure out when when are the missionaries acting as um, as doctors or as educators? When are they acting as evangelists? And, you know, does it matter uh, in terms of whether the government has to has to come in and, and help them out. I think even in 21st century United States, we haven't totally figured out all those lines. So, you know, it's it's pretty <laughs> I, understandable. Yeah, this is true. So uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, this adorable story of your daughter uh, and the the drawing that she made for the cover of the book when, when you were first starting it. Yeah. So, she, oh gosh. So my daughter was uh, probably six when I was starting. Yeah. Five or six when I was starting this book. And um, she, so she was just starting to understand <laughs> what kinds of things I worked on. And she was, was helping me uh, one afternoon and uh, decided to draw me the cover. And so I have it hanging on my, my office wall at work. Uh, she drew a, she said, well, what is it about? And I said, well, it's about you know, missionaries who go around the world, um, you know, trying to get other people to become Christians and how they relate to the the government. And so she drew me a a world that looks like a big chocolate chip cookie with a person standing on top of it, you know, who, uh, would you like to be a Christian, is coming out of their mouth. And she said, well, where do they go? And I said, well, they go all over the place. And so she said, okay, well, let's call it so the Around the World Adventures. And on the bottom, it, it's it's by Emily and Lizzie. So this book is from is 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 from her as well. Although she is that was a long time ago. <laughs> she is, uh, when she comes into my office now, she goes, "What does that say? What did I write there?" But yeah, she was actually giving me a pep talk the other day when I was saying I was you know a little nervous. The book's coming out. How are people are people going to like it or not? And she said, "Mom, of course they're going to like it because why would they buy it if they weren't going to like it?" And so, you know, I hope that that is the attitude that everyone. <laughs> Just the with as uh, as it goes forward. I was like, you know, sometimes I was like, you have books you don't like, and she goes, well, yeah, but yours is really specific. <laughs> I hope it's not. I hope it is generally interesting to all sorts of folks because I think it does tell a pretty big story about so sort of the long history of religion and politics, which hopefully has a broader audience than my daughter imagines. So I slightly off topic, but I know you're a knitter and I can't resist asking questions about knitting. So I wonder if you could talk just a little bit about the the kinds of stuff that you like to knit and, you know, if you see any relationship between your knitting and your scholarship or it's just totally a like, this is how I get my brain reset. Oh, are you a knitter as well? I am. Yes. Every day. <laughs> every day, right? So, oh, I could talk about this for a long time. I, yeah, I've been knitting for 20 something years now. And so at this point it is, uh, that's a huge part of my life. Um, and I knit when I, there are projects I can knit while I'm reading and while I'm grading and certainly when I'm in meetings. And so I, I have my project right here that I'm going to take into my department meeting later this afternoon so that I behave myself when I'm in that meeting. And, you know, I think that there's a couple of things that being a knitter have has done to really influence my scholarship. And one is that it has helped me to sort of embrace, you know, starting something new and knowing that it might take me a while to figure out what I'm doing, um, but that I will figure it out and to kind of trust the process, which, you know, especially for the kind of work I do where I'm in all kinds of different historiographies and, you know, having to go knock on doors of colleagues and say, you know, I'm writing a chapter on, on Congo, you know, what should I read? <laughs> That's not just what Americanists are writing. You know, what are, how do I sort of approach this? And how do I, you know, what should I read if I'm writing about the Boxer Uprising? And so I think that sort of knitting is a nice way of practicing every single day, figuring something new out. And sometimes things go wrong and you can fix them. One of my writing mantras, right, is that writing is revising and that we, I'm a big fan of Anne Lamont's approach to shitty rough drafts and multiple 
revisions and things like that. And, you know, that's also how I approach my knitting life, right? Where, you know, just this week I, you know, tore out the sleeves of the sweater I just finished because they were not quite right and re-knit them. And I like it so much more now. And it's a nice, you know, reminder again and again that like sometimes it's going to really hurt to have to sort of stop and, you know, toss the draft and cut out those lines, but you're going to be so much happier in the end. And I think also what I like about it as someone who enjoys feeling like I've made progress on something is that so much of uh, historical work, like it, there's a long time when you are, you know, sitting with your documents and it it's hard to sort of see anything coming out of it. And so it's just nice to kind of have a nice little boost that, you know, okay, I, you know, was sitting here reading this and, you know, my eyes feel like they're going to fall out of the head, my head from, you know, staring at the microfilm for this long. But look, I have, you know, I got a couple of inches on on this project while I was doing it. And look, I can, you know, measure, you know, you can measure time that way in a way that I think is really great. But yeah, I mean, is that is the same for you or is it? Yeah, I, you know, so much of my job involves a lot of a lot of things on a computer, right? That never become physical products. Lots of emails and moving electronic files around and editing sound waves and stuff. And so having something that's tangible is so important. And I think, you know, I can feel like my blood pressure lowering when I pick up my needles and start knitting. And I, you know, I, th- I find that really valuable. Oh, absolutely. And just having something tactile just makes, oh, and color. <laughs> I, yeah, there's it's and having something to look at that is not, you know, the, the black and white of my computer screen, but is, yeah, it is. Uh, I don't know how I would get by without it most days. Yes. Well, please tell listeners how they can get a copy of their book, whether or not they're going to knit while they read. <laughs> well, you can find the book now, hopefully most places where books are sold online. Um, it is available at the Cornell University Press website as well and wherever books are sold. Missionary, diplomacy, religion, and 19th century American foreign relations. Emily, thank you so much. This was a pleasure. It was a great book to read and I really enjoyed speaking with you. Thanks. I had a lot of fun too. Thanks for listening to Unsung History. Please subscribe to Unsung History on your favorite podcasting app. You can find the sources used for this episode in a full episode transcript at unsunghistorypodcast.com. To the best of our knowledge, all audio and images used by Unsung History are in the public domain or are used with permission. You can find us on Twitter or Instagram at unsung underscore underscore history or on Facebook at Unsung History Podcast. To contact us with questions, corrections, praise, or episode suggestions, please email kelly at unsunghistorypodcast.com. If you enjoyed this podcast, please rate, review, and tell everyone you know. Bye!